Hello and good afternoon, Data and AI Summit Europe. My name is Justin Brees, and today we're going to talk about optimizing merge on Delta Lake. I'm a senior strategic solutions architect at Databricks, and I live in the Los Angeles area. I work with some pretty big and fun customers here on the West Coast of the United States. And when I'm not hanging out and having fun with them, you can hear me playing drums, guitar, see me on the soccer field or football. And uh, I love old Porsches. So uh, if you ever want to talk about old Porsches or engines, please feel free to reach out. But in the meantime, today we're going to talk about Delta and optimizing merges. And to do that, first, we're going to start at a high level of what is actually happening under the hood when we do a merge within Delta Lake. We will then talk about partition pruning and file pruning, operation metrics, and understanding how we can use operation metrics to make informed decisions. We'll also talk about large merges and uh, some tips, tricks, and considerations. And I will also provide you with some sample configurations. Throughout, I'm going to be sprinkling in various ramblings and observations. Let's get going. So a merge within Delta Lake, it can really be broken down into three key phases. Phase one is we need to find the input files in the target that are touched by the rows that satisfy the join condition. Then we want to verify that no two source rows will modify the same target row. And we do this via an inner join. The second phase is we read those touched files again, and we write new files with updated and or inserted rows. The third phase, we leverage the Delta protocol to atomically remove the touched files and add the new files. So again, three phases. First phase, an inner join to find out which files need to be modified. The second is we actually modify those files. And the third is the atomic commit. But let's double click on the second phase uh, because that can vary depending on what you're trying to do. So the second phase, that's reading those touched files and then write the new files with the updated and or inserted rows. The type of join, well, at the end of the day, there's a join happening underneath the hood here. And the type of join varies depending on the conditions of the merge. For example, if we're doing an insert only merge, then meaning we have no updates or deletes, then we're going to do a left anti-join on the source and the target to understand what the actual inserts are going to be. So again, that's a left anti-join. If we're doing a matched only clause, so when matched, that's going to be a right outer join. Else, that means we have updates, deletes, and inserts. In that case, we do a full outer join. The consideration is because if, if you know Spark well, you can understand that a left anti-join can be broadcasted, so can a right outer join. As, but a full outer join may not be broadcasted. So if we understand, oh, now there are things can be broadcasted. Sounds good. So merge is really about these three phases. Phase one, find the files that I need to do something to. Phase two, do something to those files. And phase three, make the atomic commit. Now that we understand these three phases, we can now figure out how to optimize each of them. But before we even jump into that, before we even talk about any Delta or Spark configuration, let's use the right instance type. For example, these, um, these windows that you see here, um, it's the same exact merge statement, the same exact data, ran one after another. The only difference is the instance type. The top window, I used a 16x large over here. The second is a 2x large, so both with 1200 cores, and uh, but let's take a look at these windows. Let's read from the bottom up. On the first phase, we can see it took 1.1 minutes with the 2x large. With the 16x large, the first phase took us 4.7 minutes. That's a big difference. Let's compare. Second phase, 14 minutes versus 34 minutes. Third phase, 26 minutes versus 42 minutes. All I've done is change the instance type, and this is a pretty material impact considering not much is, was different. So really the TLDR here is choose the right instance type. Personally, big fan of 2x large, 4x large. I wouldn't really go above that uh, for merge. 
So remember how we were talking about we were breaking down merge into these three phases. So in this case, we have a the inner join, then I have inserts, updates, and deletes. So I have that full outer join. Now that we understand that, we can understand what is actually going on here. So the first part down below here is the inner join. That's what we're doing. The second part is the full outer join and the optimize write. And then finally, we are actually writing to S3. And if we want to go faster, that's when we need to start considering things like partition pruning and file pruning. And also before we even get to that, let's be good data stewards. So let's make sure we unpersist data frames uh, within Spark that you don't need. Clear up your memory. I see it a lot of times with customers. There are random data frames that are pegged to memory and chewing it up. It's unnecessary. So be good. DF that unpersist system GC clear up memory, be good. Um, the other things we need to think about is, depending on the use case, right? If it's write optimized uh, or if we're uh, reading optimized, we may need to consider changing the Delta file size. By default, the Delta file size is one gigabyte. But if we're doing a lot of uh, writes, for example, we need to distribute data throughout many, many small files versus coalescing them into one larger or into larger one gigabyte size chunks. So if it's write intensive, don't be scared. You can use 32 megabytes or less of a file size. I wouldn't really go less than 16 megabytes, but you know, at the end of the day, you have your own free will. For read intense workloads, one gigabyte, the default file size is more than enough. And yes, we are working on changing that for you uh, in the future automatically, depending on your use case, modifying those delta file sizes. Also, normal Spark rules apply. Partition size, shuffle partitions. We're not gonna dive into those today, but feel free to check out uh, either some sessions during Spark Summit on that, or uh, Daniel Toms on YouTube, a great friend and a great peer of mine, has some awesome hour and a half long just helping you demystify what's going on in Spark under the hood and really gets into the nitty gritty on partition size and shuffle partitions. Prunes, not just the delicious juice that my grandparents love. Uh, really, in all seriousness, partition printing, it's not a new concept to, um, to Spark, to Delta, or, or databases in general, or data warehouses. Um, but what a partition printing does, it allows us to disregard specific partitions. And a file print is very similar to that besides it lets us disregard specific files within a given partition. And currently within Spark and Delta Lake, we have to be very, very explicit about both of these. And I've linked to a KB on this topic. Um, but just know for right now with Delta Lake, we have to be very explicit. If we need to partition prune, we have to tell it. Same thing with file printing. And we're gonna go into an example in a minute on that. Um, we are also going to improve this in the future to be more automagic, but the reality is right now, be explicit. And when we can, we wanna prune on the left, so we prune in our source, and we wanna prune on the right in the target. Let's go through a partition pruning example. So all I'm doing here is within my source data frame. Uh, let's assume my target is partitioned by date. So I wanna go into my source, and I wanna say list all the dates in the source data frame. Then I wanna make a string of those dates. So now all that I'm left with is, is a long string of dates. 2020-10-12, comma 2020-10.18, for example. Now I wanna to go to my source and I wanna filter and make sure I only use those given, um, make sure I only have data for those given dates uh, because again, we want to prune on the left. Now the next phase, I want to prune on the right. So I'm actually going to use an in clause here. So I'm going to say I'm going to merge and um, baseline dot date in partition prune string. So now I'm just saying, hey, go to the target slash baseline and retrieve only the partitions that uh, are part of this string. This lets me skip all the other partitions that are happening uh, within that table. And this is gonna be great for your performance. The next thing is I just have the matching primary key. 
So at merge knows you know, what effectively is that joining condition. In this case, where baseline PK equals my inputs PK. And I know I'm using source, inputs, baseline, target interchangeably, but I'm sure you're, you're following along. The other thing I'd like to point out here is broadcast. Because remember, I was saying we can actually broadcast. Uh, the inner join, we can broadcast. And uh, the anti-join, we can broadcast uh, within the second phase. Uh, so we have to think about these things. So if we can actually broadcast, let's take advantage of it. Um, remember, there is a Spark configuration to change the amount that's broadcasted. By default, that's about 10 megabytes, but you can definitely increase that much, much higher. And ultimately, how do we know if things are actually happening and being pruned? Well, we can actually go to the physical plan and we can take a look. And we can see there's something all the way on the bottom called partition count. So let's just assume I have 100 partitions in this given table. And if my partition count is less than the 100, that means I'm successfully partition pruning. So on the bottom, I list it out. If partition count is less than total partitions, then congrats, bro, you partition pruning. All right, that's partition pruning. File pruning, very, very similar. The code is going to be pretty much the same until we get to here. So remember, I still have my normal baseline date in with a list of strings of the dates that I want. But Delta Lake also has the ability to do Z ordering. So um, Z ordering, we can kind of co-locate and cluster like IDs within a, a similar file. And so let's just say I have a column that I've Z ordered. I'm calling it Z order column. And I can say, and I want to, um, I have my partition pruning, but now I also want where the Z order column is less than one, two, three. So what we do for that merge is we're going to the target and we're actually uh, querying the uh, column statistics to look where um, the min max range, if one, two, three falls into that, and we retrieve those files accordingly. So we've, we've partition pruned, so we're grabbing only a subsegment, and now we're file pruning. We're grabbing a segment or a subsegment of the subsegment. So this just allows us to be super efficient and fast with our merges. Operation metrics. You may have noticed if you do a uh, SQL command, describe history and then the delta table name, you'll see a column called operation metrics. Um, as of Databricks runtime 6.5, the operation metrics got a lot better. So definitely use um, 6.5 plus. To me personally, they are the source of truth for a DML event. So my updates, inserts, but especially merge. Let's really talk through what's happening with the merge. And here are some things to think about. Num target rows copied. Personally, this is the one I focus on a ton about. Target rows copied. Let's just say we have a million uh, rows and we have two files. Each file has 500,000 rows in a file. If I need to modify one row in one file, I am copying 499,999. Now that may not seem like a big deal, but let's extrapolate to much larger tables. And if my um, if I'm only modifying one single row in every given file, I'm now gonna rewrite the entire uh, table and you don't wanna do that. So to me, this is a data point. I like to think, do what the num target rows copied relative to the total amount of rows in the table, if it gets pretty high, to me, that's a good data point. And we'll actually talk about that in the next slide. Num output bytes. So this is about 2.8 terabytes. That means this is what was written in this given merge command. Again, I like to think 2.8 terabytes relative to the size of the table. If it's 100 terabytes, I mean, we're talking about 2%. If it's uh, 10 terabytes, we're talking about 27%. So we just need to keep uh, these, these track of these type of things. The num target files added. Uh, this is also a good one right there. It's about just under 900,000 files that have been added. Um, if I'm using smaller Delta file sizes, like I was talking about before, of 32 megabytes, again, not necessarily a big deal, but it's a data point. 
And then finally, num target rows inserted, updated, deleted. These are crucial because you're expecting to insert, update, or delete within each micro batch or each batch that you're doing. So you should really understand, do these uh, equal out your expectation of rows inserted to rows um, actually inserted in delta and understand if there is a difference. So really, I mean, my takeaway is if I look at inserted, updated, and deleted, I have 1.2, 1.3, and about 900,000. So I've got about 3.2 or 3.3 million rows. So the TLDR is to modify 3.3 million rows. I'm copying, um, yeah, I'm copying billions. So maybe that to me is telling me perhaps I need to lay out my data differently on disk. This is where I was talking about if my num target rows copied is insanely high relative to the total amount of rows in the entire table, this tells me that maybe we need to partition differently. Maybe we need to leverage a Z order. Maybe we need smaller delta file sizes, or maybe it's a combination of all three. But again, when I look at the operation metrics, it is the source of truth. It's providing me with some data points so I can make informed decisions. Large merges. I told you we'd talk about it, and now we're going to do it. So me, personal opinion, when you have a large table, we're talking about many terabytes of data, give each table its own S3 bucket. And if you're doing a structured stream, give that checkpoint its own S3 bucket as well. And the main reason is because S3 parallelization or parallelism is defined by the prefix. So let's take a look and understand what is a prefix. This is an actual S3 bucket that I have, and no, it's not public, um, JBreeze Databricks bucket. Underneath that, I have a partition, year equals 2019 and year equals 2018. This is good because year 2019 is a prefix. Year equals 2018 is another prefix. And S3 parallelism is defined at the prefix. The prefix limit is 3,500 writes per second and 5,500 or 3,500 reads per second and 5,500 writes per second. So each um, prefix here, which is also a partition, can get these limits. So that means in total, this table right now, I can do 7,000 reads per second and 11,000 writes per second. Now let's look at a bad architecture. Same bucket, JBreeze Databricks bucket. I have a um, prefix under that called data. Underneath that, I have table A and table B and same thing, year equals 2019, 2018. But the prefix definition is what is directly under the S3 bucket. So in this case, it's data. So now data, everything under data, doesn't matter how nested it is, is subject to these S3 prefix limits of 3,500 reads and 5,500 writes. So that tells me for data, so that's table A, B, and all these other partitions underneath, I'm subject to 3,500 uh, reads and 5,500 writes. So that's why to me, when we have a large table, give it its own S3 bucket and partition just under that. So now you get all of these prefixes and partitions and all of this glorious, glorious parallelism. Now I know someone is probably writing in right now um, into the comments or an email or messenger pigeon that S3 will eventually repartition. And I completely agree, they will eventually repartition. But that can take time, and I'm not the most patient person in the world. And so and I just despise getting uh, S3 throttling. So that's why, to me, um, just give each, each uh, huge table its own S3 bucket. The alternative you can do is also reach out to your AWS TAM. They are super helpful in helping you pre-partition. But again, these are just extra steps that you have to go through I'd rather just give each large table its own S3 bucket, a lot easier, a lot cleaner. Some other large merge tips, uh, especially if we're using large clusters and we're talking more than 900 cores, um, in addition to what we were just talking about, is optimize writes. Delta has a great feature called optimize writes and uh, random prefixes, and as well as writing at the root. 
And optimized writes ensure that one core writes to one partition. And it does this via a final shuffle. So if I, um, and it does it up to the uh, bin size that you specify. So by default, it's a uh, 512 meg. So if I need to write a gig to a, a given partition, we'll actually use two cores because we, we pack one core full of data. We shuffle all the data going to that partition to one core up to the bin size of roughly 512. Then we'll grab a second core for that given partition. Uh, doing this helps prevent lots of small files and it also helps um, S3 from throttling you by having all 900 cores writing tiny, tiny files to the same partition at the same time. So super helpful feature. So remember, huge clusters, optimized writes, um, the delta random file prefixes is big as well. Delta pro file prefixes, if we were to ls on an S3 bucket, we would see um, instead of year equals 2019, we'd see a random prefix, a series of letters, like three or four numbers and letters. Then the delta log keeps track of which files and which, which files belong in which partition. And we do this is because we want to really prevent hot spotting within S3 here. Each of these uh, random prefixes gets all that lovely parallelization that we were just talking about. And so by, by doing that, we now really help spread the load throughout S3 so we don't get throttled. So for huge clusters, optimize writes, random prefixes, and write at the root, just like we were talking about. Some other configs that you're going to want to consider, uh, the multi-part threshold, super helpful, um, 204 is, is completely fine, but it really depends on the, the file sizes that you're, you're writing about. Optimize write, yes. The num shuffle blocks by default is about 50,000. You could definitely up that to 100,000 if you have many terabytes um, that you're trying to do, but I really wouldn't go above that. So don't go above 100,000. Randomized file prefixes, we just talked about it, and make sure you enable dynamic file pruning. And to prove that this works, I had a 2.7 terabyte change set and ended up writing it um, with 2,400 cores in 1,700 minutes. More importantly, zero S3 throttling or complaining because I followed these three things above. Optimize writes, random file prefixes, and writing at the root. Final recap. We talked about merge basics. We talked about the three phases that are actually happening during a merge. We talked about partition pruning and file pruning operation metrics and using those to make informed decisions and questions for that matter. We went through large merge tips, sample configs. So, you know, I can't, uh, I can't thank you enough for attending this. Feedback is super important. Um, reach out to me personally if you'd like, justin.brees at databricks.com. Um, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, evening, morning, wherever you are, and uh, thanks for attending.